the last video we talked about injection. Cross-site scripting is a form of injection, and there's three main types. You have reflected cross-site scripting, where the attacker inputs HTML or JavaScript into an application, and this script is designed to redirect the legitimate user to a website controlled by the attacker. Storage cross-site scripting is where the application will store user input. So say you have an online blog where every, anybody is allowed to post, the attacker would create a legitimate account, they'll post a blog post where they have put in malicious code as their blog post or as part of the blog post. And then when a user comes in, that blog post might have an external link attached to it. And when the legitimate user logs in that blog, that malicious code will execute. Uh, DOM cross-site scripting is a cross-site scripting attack that specifically uh, targets JavaScript. Okay, and this is this will input malicious JavaScript code specifically for use by other users. Now, for the exam, you're not going to need to know the different types of cross-site scripting attacks. You're just going to need to know that cross-site scripting is a type of injection attack and it's a common attack against web applications. How you prevent cross-site scripting is, again, you blacklist, you create a list of prohibited characters, and th these are one of the main prevention areas. There's a couple others, but by blacklisting these characters to include the apostrophe, most of all, you're making it difficult for the attacker you're making it so the attacker cannot input code. They, without the use of these spe special characters, the attacker cannot make code that can be executed. The characters are needed for that input to be interpreted as code. And then you can have uh, different categories for your input. So you can have attribute values, say name, uh, first name, last name, place, email address, and you'll have different rules for each attribute. So the name could only be text inputs. It won't include characters or numbers. That doesn't make sense. Or uh, your email address should be such and such, and then the at symbol such.com. Okay? So example at example.com, as opposed to apostrophe backslash open score, drop tables, etc., any type of code inputs, you'd restrict those attributes to only include what's necessary. And you'll see this in many different types of uh, web applications that practice good security. When you're picking your password, your, your password can't contain certain special characters or your username is only allowed to have text as an example. And then practicing uh, sanitization or escape of untrusted data. So if the data does not meet the context that you, or the parameters, the input parameters that you've specified for your web application, then that data is sanitized. It's not stored or executed by the web application. Cross-site request forgery is, a, it's an older type of attack. It's not as prevalent today, but this is when uh, attackers use malicious code to force a user to send a request to a website that they have privileges to. Okay, so you're forcing the user to send a legitimate request to an, an, ac uh, an asset or web application that that user already has access to just with a piece of malicious code. So here, we're going to go through an example. So say, uh, attacker has inputted malicious code onto a website. We'll call that website website number one. When a user navigates to website one, that code automatically executes and that causes the user to send a request, a legitimate request to website number two to change their password, okay? Based on that malicious code. The attacker has set up that code to change the password to a certain value. So now the attacker can navigate to website number two and input that password if they know the username and access that site. Privilege escalation. 
This is what occurs when an attacker has raised their privilege or raised their level of access within a system <clears throat> greater than what they already have access to. And this can, can be combined with other types of attacks. So say in our cross-site request forgery example, the attacker gains access to a website using that password change method. Now they have access to a site, say they have basic privileges. Say it's a, a web application that does email, okay? The attacker now has basic user level access to that web application. They could perform a type of attack where they can either gain access to another account within the system or raise their privileges within that account. So change the level of uh, abilities or level of privilege they have within, say, Active Directory to include different permissions and different functions for that account that they currently have access to. This would be an escalation of privilege account, anything that raises the attacker's level of access. In a cloud environment, escalation of privilege can lead to what's known as guest escape, where you have multiple tenants or multiple customers all sharing the same cloud research. So say you have a data storage, data storage device where you have many different companies subscribe to this uh, cloud service to store their data. That cloud service will use different servers and virtual instances or virtual partitions that they can then sell to different customers. The actual piece of hardware will be the same, but virtual partitions, partitions will separate each of the customers, okay? So if an attacker is able to gain access to one of those partitions, it's possible for them to escalate their privilege to gain a higher level of access and then possibly escape that one instance and affect other virtualized instances within the cloud environment. This is known as guest escape. Every device on a network has a hard-coded uh, identifier on the network interface controller. This is known as the MAC address, okay, or media access control address. The MAC address is going to look just like this string here, okay? It's possible for attackers to fool other devices on a network into thinking that their MAC address is something other than what it appears to be on the, uh, on the NIC or the network interface controller. So attackers can use this to hide their identity, to maintain anonymity, and to perpetrate other types of attacks that use uh, this MAC address as a precursor to you know, fooling other devices into sending them data. ARPA Address Resolution Protocol is a protocol used to discover the link layer address within the OSI model and it's used to discover, uh, it's used to discover MAC addresses that we just talked about. Within a LAN or a local area network attackers can it's called ARP poisoning. They can send false ARP requests and they can fool different devices within that local area network into thinking that their, you know, the attacker's machine has a different MAC address or has a MAC address of another device in that local area network. So the, what this will do is this will allow the attacker to view the communication going to that MAC address by spoofing their own MAC address changing their MAC address to be that of their target, uh, the local area network would send communications to that MAC address of a legitimate target, but now the attacker has actually changed their MAC address to read as the same as that target. So the attacker would then be receiving the communication instead. This is done through uh, sending false ARP reply messages to the network gateway, the network gateway which would control the local area network. So in essence, you're changing the association between the MAC address 
and the target IP address. Okay, so instead of you, know, you would say that this target one, that IP address is no longer this MAC address, and my attacker system actually has that is that MAC address. So you should send all that communication to me, the attacker. DNS poisoning is similar. Uh, it's basically DNS spoofing. It's when an attacker gains access to a DNS server and they change one of the directories to read as a different website. So imagine an attacker finds a phone book and they open the phone book and they white out a piece of the phone book and they write in a different uh, phone number. We're on a Google search in Google Maps. The attacker will find the Google Maps entry for a business and they'll change the phone number for that business off of Google Maps. Whenever anybody, any other user looks at that phone book or looks at that Google Maps listing and sees that new uh, phone number, they're going to call that new number instead of the legitimate number of the business. This is the same thing with websites. The attacker is basically changing uh, the directory or the what the search term would point to, what website would be pointed to from the DNS server. So when a user logs onto the DNS server, they get redirected to a different website. And this is a website usually under the attacker's control. It may, this website may be identical or nearly identical to a legitimate website. So this is an attacker made website made to look like the real website where the attacker will have a login portion probably to look identical as the first website. And when users unknowingly put in their username and password to conduct business as usual, the attackers would then harvest that information instead. So think of DNS as a directory, and in DNS poisoning, an attacker is altering that directory to read something else.